Lawyers of Reddit, what is the most outrageous case someone has asked you to take? Story 1. I'm late to the gaming attorney to you. One day a gentleman came to my office who wanted to sue his former employer. My office handles general civil matters, and I handle our labor matters. In addition, he also specifically requested a female attorney for reasons unrelated to this story. I met with him for about half an hour. He explained that he worked in his position and believes that it is gender biased. In my jurisdiction, the employer must demonstrate a legitimate, non-discriminatory reason for the termination. And while this hurdle is surmountable, it is high. I asked him if he had ever been disciplined, taken to court, or written up in the past to determine if an employer could say he was an unsuitable employee. If he had a perfect reference, our job is easier. He said yes, 12 times, in two years. I ended the interview, thanked him for his interest in our business, but told him that we would not be able to proceed. I sent him several reference numbers, but I don't know if he ever found anyone to take his case. Story 2. Not a lawyer, but a family friend. She had someone come in to sue Starbucks because someone spilled a latte or smoothie or something on the sidewalk, and she slipped on it and hit her head. She claimed Starbucks was to blame because this wouldn't have happened if Starbucks didn't add extra whipped cream to the drink. Story 3. I've had a few, but the best was a custody divorce about five years ago. This guy was an extremely smart engineer, but he fell in love with a woman who was just white trash. He married her, and at the time of the divorce, they had two children aged six and four. One day, she told him she wanted a divorce and wanted him to move out. It was a huge house in a gated community, so I advised him to move to another part of the house so he could be near his children. I also told him that she wanted him out of the house so she could let the man she was cheating on him with move in. He didn't believe she was cheating, so I told him to go to the gate and check the logs. Sure enough, my client left for work every morning at 6.30 a.m., and around 7.30 a.m. three to five times a week, another man would check at the gate and say he was on his way to my client's house. I dug up the name, and it was my client's wife's ex-boyfriend who had just served eight years in prison for domestic assault and attempted murder. Part of his parole was the requirement to register as an intimate partner offender. My client met with his wife and recorded her response. One party consent state. She actually confessed to cheating, admitted that her lover was an intimate partner, and then told my client that she wanted to move her lover out. And if my client didn't move out, she would make their children's lives miserable and make sure they knew it because that dad is selfish. After that, she became a lawyer, and we played the tape for her lawyer at the first conference. He made a little noise about consent, and it didn't sound like her, but he knew that her allowing a registered felon to be intimate with her children was a curse. He eventually got a house, full custody, and bank accounts. She received one car, her clothes, and jewelry, which were very valuable, some household items, and $25,000 in cash. She literally moved from a luxury house in a gated community in the nicest part of town to a trailer in an unincorporated part of the county. Do not chase after garbage. Story 4. My dad's story as a previous attorney in California. This husband and wife divorced. Everything went well, except that the husband asked for partial custody. It was fine, except for the fact that they had no children. No, the man wanted partial custody of the dog. According to the jurisdiction, pets are personal property, so this was out of the question. But my dad had to wonder why this guy wanted partial custody of a couple. So why do you want partial custody? Does a pet mean that much to you? No, we both like the dog, so she'll have custody and she'll like it. But when I get custody, I'm going to take her to the vet and give her this 101 about what you don't tell your lawyer. Story 5. Interned at a law firm. A client came in to consult with my boss. They owned a horse farm in the country, and their sister had driven one of the farm's horses into a marshy, boggy area off the beaten track. The client was determined to sue the sister for diminishing the value of her horse and wanted to recover $500 from her for the damaged goods. My boss just sat there and looked at her. Being the good guy he is, he told her, Miss, this is going to cost you over $500 in legal fees. You better do it in small claims court. But I wouldn't recommend it either, as the judge will probably dismiss the case. The client passionately sued her sister in court with an attorney to teach her that she can't just ride other people's horses without permission. Boss told her that he could not, in good faith, assist with this suit. Story 6. I once worked as a misdemeanor prosecutor and heard some really amazing defense arguments that the defendant would not have made had he had a lawyer. My favorite was this guy accused of speeding who gave what I call five feet of dollars, the defense. 
He pleaded guilty, but wanted to explain to the judge that he had just eaten a $5 roast beef at Subway and was rushing home before falling asleep because roast beef is a sedative. The judge smiled and asked if he meant turkey, a dinner meat that can produce some form of mild sedative effect. The man realized his mistake and said that the length of $5 feet contained both. I'm trying not to laugh as he's used the word $5 feet about half a dozen times by this point, like he's actively promoting Subway. The judge said he didn't think $5 foot lengths were available at Subway. At that moment, the whole courtroom laughed. The judge told him to choose his food more carefully and to slow down, and ordered him to pay the maximum fine. Story 7. I worked as a paralegal for a large personal injury firm for several years. Two unusual stories. A letter from a man in prison. Companies that advertise on television receive many of these. He wanted to sue Oprah. Oprah. Because she was a witch and put a curse on his body. This curse caused him pain in his eyes, liver, and testicles. It was a letter on six pages. A man called to sue Burger King because he and his mother got sick after eating 50 burgers over the weekend. He said they usually buy a lot of hamburgers and freeze them to eat during the week. Yes, freeze whole cooked hamburgers, buns, condiments, and everything else. Of course, they both got sick and couldn't leave the house for fear of peeing their pants. The fact is that BK Corporate already reimbursed them for the cost of their meal when they complained. He wanted more compensation for their horrible experience and wanted them to pay him for the taxi fare. Yes, they took a taxi to Burger King and made the taxi wait while they cooked 50 hamburgers. We did not take any cases. Story 8. I'm not a lawyer, but I've worked at a law firm and attended some meetings to take notes. A guy came to us. It was an evaluation of his case, and my boss, a lawyer, asked what he wanted to do. He said to sue underscore 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 lake. He mentioned a specific lake, but I don't remember which one. I did my best to stay calm, and my boss asked why he wanted to sue the lake. He said it ate his boat. We asked if he meant that he had sunk. He said no, it didn't. It ate it. One day, the boat disappeared, and he checked the video, and the video showed that the water level in the lake rose almost four inches and then dropped again, causing the boat to break free from the dock and sink. He showed us a video, and sure enough, there's this little four-person boat with a motor, and that's what happened. My boss said she would take the case, but felt he could not guarantee how well she would do in court. She then asked if he knew who the owner was. He was the owner. Also, he just wanted to sue the lake, not the owner. When my boss said she needed money to do the paperwork, he dropped a brick of cash. Story 9. Not a lawyer, but I have a cool story. My grandfather promised my cousin when he was a child that if he ever needed help in his life, he would help him. My cousin went to the University of Virginia and then wanted to go to law school. He didn't have enough money to attend, so he sued my grandfather on the grounds that my grandfather had promised him something. My grandfather didn't want to go to court, so he just agreed. It was very sad, and I didn't see my cousin for more than five years. Story 10. After law school, I once had a potential client who wanted me to sue Canada. Apparently, he could not enter the country because of his criminal record. I tried to convince him that a sovereign nation should set its own rules for entry into the country. But he insisted that we could make a lot of money by suing Canada. I didn't take up the matter, but told him I might be able to get him a letter saying sorry. From Canada edit, it to him. I dictated it on the phone while drinking coffee. Thank goodness for the grammarians on Reddit for saving me from this disastrous life mistake. Story 11. It was not my case, but instead was handled by my tort professor. The client came to his office to get a deposit for an apartment. The landlord didn't want the deposit back because, IARC, she was in breach of the lease. She believed that she should be allowed to terminate the lease because someone had broken into the apartment and assaulted her. Tort's prof files a lawsuit seeking not only the return of the security deposit, but also damages against the former tenant. The theory of damages was that the landlord had a duty to provide adequate protection against such an intrusion. The landlord did not dispute whether the tenant properly locked all the doors. She did. But argued that it was not foreseeable that the person could have committed a crime. In essence, the landlord argued that it was unforeseeable that the attacker could gain access to the balcony and that the landlord fulfilled his duty by putting a lock on the sliding glass door. Start with the duty of care. The landlord only put a standard thumb lock on the sliding glass door. A similar break-in, without an attack, occurred in an apartment on the first floor of the same complex shortly before the attack in question. Then the landlord provided all the apartments on the first floor with bars to prevent the sliding glass doors from opening from the outside. 
Okay, but what about the fact that the attack could not have been foreseen? She was on the second floor, and the apartments on the first floor are not similar in that they are on the first floor, and her apartment is not. This is what the professor called the torts Spider-Man defense. The landlord claimed that the apartment was on the second floor, and the attacker entered the apartment through a sliding glass door from the second floor balcony, so it was not foreseeable that an ordinary person would be able to enter the balcony, except that it was. The plaintiff's attorney provided photographs of the apartment complex in question. On the balcony of the second floor, there was an air conditioner directly below him. Lo and behold, the photographic evidence showed that the average-sized plaintiff's attorney's shoulders were nearly level with the bottom of the balcony as he stood on the AC unit. In other words, based on the height of the air conditioner and its proximity to the balcony, it was quite foreseeable that the attacker could enter the apartment. Leaving the question open, why didn't the landlord provide this tenant with the same bar to keep the door closed? Tenants returned their deposit and then some, edited to add, these facts are as I remember them from my second semester criminology class about 13 years ago, so I apologize if they are a little off. Story 12. The public defender is here. I was protecting the dog. Not just any dog person, but a serial bad pit bull person. He was arrested, charged, and after several bail applications, released to court. He was then arrested for flipping another pit bull. The best part was his explanation of how he ended up in the kennel the second time. You see, he dropped his liquor bottle in there and had to crawl to get it back. He lost his pants in the process. Happens all the time. We took a plea under the old statute they used to prosecute for sodomy, with an agreement to have no contact with the victim. The best is the judge. I remember him looking at my client and saying, I don't know what to tell you, but you, you can't do this. Story 13. Neighbors sued a woman for missing, and her house burned down, because the fire spread to their house, and they needed to do roof repairs. Their argument was that her conduct in taking the homeless into her home to give them food and clothing was recklessly negligent. Fortunately, I defended the case, but they had a lawyer, so someone took the case. I think they just wanted the insurance money, but we took them all the way, and they accepted our Section 998 offer to settle for nothing a week before trial. Edit. Oh, I forgot. They also filed an emotional distress lawsuit there for having to see her body taken out of the house. Story 14. Only a law student, but this is probably one of my all-time favorites. Nicks versus, in the 1880s, Hedden was effectively a mass affair with the sole purpose of proving that the tomato was actually a vegetable and not a fruit. It comes from the Port of New York taxing tomatoes as vegetables. The Nicks family, who imported a lot of tomatoes, tried to sue to get back all the taxes they paid because they considered tomatoes to be fruit. Technically, they are. Edit. Probably should have said who won. Tomatoes are still fruits but they can be taxed as vegetables. Resources. Story 15. Someone just asked me to modify their child support because they lost their job. The child is 17 years and 11 months old. Get the fudge out of my office. Edit. Just to be clear. In my state, child support always ends at age 18 or 19 if the child earns a high school diploma or GED from an accredited institution. This kid has already graduated from HS. Story 16. A now, but there was a neighbor. One day she was asked to protect a boy who was doing something rather strange. It all started when the guy's neighbors complained to the local council about the stench coming from his tanks. The council came to own a butcher's shop, and it turned out that it was filled with a whole shed of dead chickens. Not restaurant waste chicken or stale, fully feathered. A quick nudge at the chickens revealed that this was not the first time they had pecked, and that the unfortunate birds had in fact been bludgeoned to death by the wrong rooster. A quick search was carried out and a 5 mm thick rubber apron with scratches all around was found. He was caked with bloody feathers and semen, according to laboratory data. After a little investigation, it turned out that his wife was holding chickens and jerking him off with them spectacularly, with his cock through a hole in his apron and his legs scratching at the rubber until they died, and then she'd grab another one and start again while he doesn't cough up his dirty yogurt into them. His defense was that he wasn't actually them. His wife was doing it by moving the fudge pillows. She said the case hinged on the fact that the chickens could not be shown to be agreeable about everything. He and his wife spent an equal amount of time on it. Story 17. I once had a pro bono case where someone claimed he couldn't pay child support because he joined a religious congregation that required him to give up money and material possessions. Basically, they were communal religious hippies. He seemed sincere. His girlfriend, not the mother of his child, 
got him into it, and I had letters and affidavits from a bunch of people in his congregation about the work he was doing and evidence that he was involved in various youth ministries. He was not paid, but his church provided his basic needs. I argued that the Constitution's Freedom of Religion Clause, which prohibits the government from interfering with the free exercise of religion, does not allow the government to take coercive measures against it. I admitted that he owed money, but argued that he could not be imprisoned. We don't have debtors' prisons in this country, and we don't imprison people for what they consider to be a religious calling, I told the MTD hearing. I was able to prevent any enforcement action against him for about eight months before he said drop it and went to work for a trucking company. I wonder what happened to him. Story 18. Not a lawyer, but worked with the district attorney, and we had this case where we prosecuted a person for burglary after dark. First degree. Background. Defendant and cohort allegedly broke into someone's home after dark. The person who was with him pleaded guilty to the crime for a reduced sentence. There were three witnesses in the house who identified him, and his DNA was found at the scene along with some other identifying material. Fast forward three years, and he somehow managed to postpone the date several times. I was there when he complained that his lawyer was talking nonsense, even though she was probably one of the best public defenders in the area, because she kept telling him to turn himself in because he was going to get busted at trial. He somehow extended it for another month. As a result, he was convicted and sentenced to 12 years in prison. Here's the key point. If he had just accepted the plea deal, he would have been out of jail by the time he was sentenced. Note, we made him a plea offer and it was a good offer. Three years. TLDR. Don't be an idiot when faced with an unlikely situation. Story 19. My best friend called me in a panic last year because she was trying to get a visitor's pass to a local military base but there was an arrest warrant on her file and she was freaking out thinking she might be arrested. She was released, but not told what the warrant was for, just the name of the city where the charges were from. I called the city and they found it for me. It was petty theft. She didn't even know where the town was. Three hours away and very small, mostly drive through They had my friend's address, social security number, etc. After using her payslips at the bank where she works and contacting the officers, we discovered that it was not her but in fact, a local woman who was well-known in the area. A woman stole $5 worth of hot dogs and left a check with her aunt's name on it. The woman's name and my friend's were somewhat similar, and when the officers filled out the police report, they filled out the form with my friend's information. I've never had so much fun calling for free. We all joke that our friend works in a bank during the day and steals hot dogs at night. Story 20. Okay, crowd around the kids. Uncle the Immature Lawyer has a 100% true story to tell you about not only the case I was asked to take, but the one I actually took because it was so interesting. A female client comes in. She is divorced, but she tells me that her husband died in another state at the end of the country. According to the client, her husband was a tycoon in his specific field and had well over $15 million at the time of his death. It is worth noting that this was her husband's second marriage and that my client was about 25 years younger than her now deceased husband. So I take the client and start researching, and I can find no county in any state where there is a marriage certificate of these people. A client sends me what she says is her marriage certificate, but it's a Staples-esque award form printed and signed by some priest in a completely disjointed state. So now the pieces are starting to fall into place. And here's what happened. One. Senior business tycoon tells his first wife he's leaving her. She says, go ahead, but we never break up over dollar, dollar, dollar. Two, an elderly business tycoon meets a gullible younger woman and tells her he's divorced somewhere in Mexico. Never happened. Three, senior business tycoon pays a priest to perform the full ceremony. I'm talking church, bridesmaids, rings, the whole nine yards. The priest simply never notifies any parish about the wedding. Four. An elderly business tycoon regularly sends his new wife $25,000 a month cash via FedEx plane package. My client shows me the monthly FedEx checks she saved from shipping. 5. The senior business tycoon has no will and has children from both marriages. Now, imagine my comfort level when I have to introduce these two sets of kids. It was insanely awkward and awkward, and the irony was how much some of the half siblings looked exactly like each other. It was strange. In the end, all the children shared all the money left in the estate, and everything worked out as well as it could have. But it was an uncontested situation. 
Story 21. I recently settled a broken banana case. It was kind of crazy. Our firm represents many veterans. We get several calls a year from vets who claim they have had a microchip or transmitter inserted into their head. They claim that they hear radio waves, that it interrupts their thoughts, that they have been experimented on, etc. These are always strange calls. One summer in college, I worked for a firm that handled thousands of hurricane and personal injury claims. Sometimes claimants would call the firm to ask questions or start a lawsuit, and we would take turns answering those calls. One day this guy called and said that when the water level rose after a hurricane, sharks escaped from the city aquarium and one of them attacked him. He seemed like he was crazy and kept going into all these crazy details and claimed that his banana and testicle were bitten off and his wife didn't love him anymore because he couldn't perform like he used to. I didn't answer the call, but I was sitting next to the guy who did. About ten minutes later, I looked past the guy on the phone and saw three colleagues cracking up in the hallway. It turns out that the shark boy was actually a prank by a colleague who called the office from her cell phone. He kept it up for about 40 minutes until he finally broke character. It was awesome. Story 22. I'm sure this will be buried, but I had a wrongful death case where a guy accidentally overdosed his girlfriend on meth. They were both addicts, and apparently adding some sweets to your peach will get you high faster. On the night in question, they decided to put methamphetamine on his banana, at which point he became intimate with her. She died from this. I will never forget it. Story 24. This is not my story, but I think it fits here. I live in China. In recent months, the government has made it increasingly difficult for companies and individuals to withdraw money from the country for reasons. One bright spark sparked the idea for his company to one, set up an American front company, two, enter into arbitration with said company for breach of contract, and then three, lose on purpose by demanding that the American company be awarded, thus taking money out of the country. Genius. Story 25. I once posted this in another thread, but a federal judge called a senior lawyer at my firm a few years ago and asked us to take a case for the plaintiff pro se, i.e., a guy who introduces himself. The judge's personal rule, and it's a good one, is that if the plaintiff goes beyond summary judgment, he gets them free lawyers. Going to summary judgment, in short, means that both sides have presented their version of the facts, and there is at least some question as to who is right. We took the case using the time-honored principle of don't give up. A federal judge, when he asks for a favor, is an idiot. The boy was the plaintiff. He sued the cops, the city, and the county. Our client led the cops on a high-speed chase through a fairly dense city, and he went to prison for six. Ten years for that, now I forget. However, he sued because police officers used excessive force against him when they arrested him. Regardless of the crime, once the cops have you under control, they can't just start kicking the cow out of you while you're in handcuffs. So it's not a nice case, but you get used to it. Your goal is just to make sure they get everything the law gives them. Then, during our first interview, two troubling factors emerged. Looking back on his life story, he recalls that once in his youth, he ate sweets and got kicked out of a college class. Enraged, he goes to the parking lot, finds a girl standing by his car, and attacks her. Yes, our client. For this, he served 10 years in prison. Now, apparently 15 years later, the police can treat rapists unfairly in an unrelated incident, and everyone deserves equal protection under the law. But yes, it is much harder to emotionally support your client when they bring it up. Speaking specifically about this case, if you're a cynic, you might ask, was he driving drunk the night he decided to lead the cops on a car chase? So I asked, and he said, well, I had one cup at 8 p.m., but it was at 2 a.m., so to be honest, it had to be out of my system. Perfectly. Then, of all people, it was an elderly intern who said, Did you take anything else at the time? Oh, I had Coke and candy that night. Jesus, man. Earlier, when we asked about alcohol, you didn't want to volunteer. But more importantly, if he consumed all those sweets, how well does he remember all those beatings from years ago? He had no other witnesses who would speak on his side. Anyway. We got him a nice settlement, probably better than he deserved, and forgot about him. I found him a year or two later and he was on the state's most wanted list. I don't even want to know. Story 26. If a client came in and told me he needed a restraining order against his neighbor, seemed pretty normal. Said his neighbor threatened to break him up. Then I started digging. Said he installed video monitors around the perimeter of his house and they were all trained on his neighbor's house. I asked him why, 
and he told me that he was sure his neighbor was spying on him. Swear that his neighbor hacked his wireless network and knew what he was doing on the internet and that his neighbor knew when he was taking a cow and when. He told me that he could hear his neighbor talking to other people in his house and on the phone about what the client had been doing in the house all day. I asked him, you mean, can you really hear that? And he said no, but he felt it, like he knew it was happening. I referred him to several mental health experts I knew and got him out of the office as quickly as possible. By the way, the neighbor threatened him because he told the client to stop pointing the cameras at the house or he would beat him up. Story 27. I had to defend a 50-year-old father from his divorced wife and 15-year-old daughter, whom he regularly assaulted since the age of seven. The firm I worked for forced me to take this case, which I won because the guy was a doctor and had lots of friends and witnesses who could vouch for him. In the end, the mother began to doubt her own daughter, and this was the final blow to the case. During a closing hearing with my client where his daughter was in the courtroom, he admitted to me that he is still very attracted to her and regrets not living in the same house with her anymore so he can at least watch her in the bathroom. Story 28. So, a little background. I spent 10 years representing disabled adults and children in various cases at a legal services firm, so our clients were not charged fees. A man came to me who had a muscle disease due to which he could only move his hands. The state, through the Department of Vocational Rehabilitation, paid for his college education. He chose a commercial institution and received a degree in sound engineering. He came to us because the department refused to pay for his MBA. They only pay for bachelor and junior partner. He claimed that no one would hire him because of his disability, and he listened to an MBA to start his own business, a recording studio. There were no legal grounds for considering the case, but we had to take it because it was sent to us by the Congress delegation. He lied repeatedly and basically didn't care when I called him out and he didn't realize he was committing perjury. In fact, he already had a recording studio business that had several clients which led to his business. He also couldn't prepare much for the audition because he was taking the LSAT. We went to the hearing and it was an excruciating 90 minutes as the opposing attorney recounted every lie. It was an administrative hearing, so he spoke despite my concerns about perjury. I wanted to melt on the floor. We lost. He wanted us to appeal and we refused. But I walked him through the process and copied and sent him his 113K page file. He refused to deliver. Last I heard, he was appealing the denial of his law degree. Story 29. When I was a junior associate in the regional office of a large firm, one of my assigned jobs was to handle some of the I want to speak to a lawyer calls that came into the front desk. We didn't pick up cases off the street. Partners, by chance some random person called the front desk with something really noteworthy, decided that someone should take them, document them, and, if necessary, send sorry we don't do these kinds of things, letters to protect yourself after the deadline, or alternatively send it to a partner if it was really promising, which was rare because people with big legal budgets don't just call a number in the law firm phone book. One day we got a call through the front desk saying, I want to speak to a lawyer. He calls me on the phone. The liquor store stole my taxes. What am I sorry for? Liquor store stole my tax return. Did you give them a check? Well, no, the guy at the wine store paid my taxes for me, and now he won't give me a check. Sorry, we don't handle cases like that. You went to the prosecutor's office. They can file criminal charges and try to get you a refund. Story 30. Not a lawyer, but a board member of a nonprofit organization that provides free HIV tests. We do a quick smear from the oral cavity, the results of which are returned after 15 minutes. During this time, we talk to the patient and assess any behavioral risks to try to minimize exposure to HIV and other STIs. We also tell them that if the test is positive, we will do another smear. If it comes back positive, they will need to go and get blood drawn to confirm it. You can get a false positive if your saliva has the right combinations of proteins. We had a guy who tested positive twice. We then made an appointment with the health department to have him draw blood to confirm. He never appears. Instead, he told all his family and friends that he had AIDS, made a will to give away all his possessions after his imminent death, and went on a drunken spree. When he finally did a blood test and it came back negative, he showed up at our offices again. He was so happy he was negative, but he needed to know, who should I sue? He wasn't sure if it was us or the company that makes the swab tests. Story 31. Standard disclaimers. None of this is legal advice. And if an anonymous person on the internet says that he is a lawyer, it is not necessary to believe him. 
If you need real legal advice, consult a lawyer offline. My practice mostly keeps me away from these things, but one. During my internship at the prosecutor's office, I came across several potential cases that looked like this. The applicant was a bald guy in his 50s with a pot belly. He met this girl a few weeks ago and he says they really hit it off. They actually started dating and she moved in with him. What is she like? Oh, burning 20-year-old. Anyway, it was tough from the start. She always brought her friends over and used or borrowed his things and she went through a lot of pocket money. Then one day she just up and disappeared with all the cash in his wallet. Now she will not take his calls, etc. He wants to prosecute her for the theft. And I read between the lines. It sounds a lot like this guy just hired a woman, fell in love, and then got dumped. Two, I have seen a police officer file an accident report describing events that were literally impossible, given the physical evidence. The impact marks are on the opposite side of the car. I don't know what happened there. I think the cop was close enough to personally see the accident when it happened, but didn't really expect it or pay attention to it. His official version did not match any of the witnesses he interviewed. The party, he said, was at fault, fought it, and the charges were dropped. Three, I heard someone say, and I'm paraphrasing as much as possible, why don't you pursue him? What do you mean prosecutors are wasting their time? You sure had plenty of time to bring me to justice when I hit that retarded girl. I'm not kidding. Four, unlicensed door-to-door -door dentistry. I have not been involved in the prosecution or defense of this, but apparently it is a thing and very illegal in my state. Story 32. When I was a first-year intellectual property lawyer, 2000, a woman asked me to represent her in patenting her body technology. She believed that her body was filled with technology that could be useful to the UN or UNICEF. She explained that several years ago she was kidnapped and woke up in the White House in Washington. Still and incapacitated, Hillary Clinton personally operated on her, despite Bill Clinton trying to stop Hillary. Hillary then surgically implanted secret technology into her body and brain that allows Hillary to control this woman's body and mind and allows Hillary to see, hear, and feel what this woman sees, hears, and feels. She expressed the need to act quickly because Clinton operatives have been tracking and searching for her since she fled the White House just over a year ago. Fortunately, the firm I work for represented the Clinton family in a local defamation suit, so I was conflicted. When I told her about the conflict, she was convinced that I was now a Clinton operative and that Hillary had read her mind and gotten to me before she could. Story 33. Nonprofit homeless advocate. Here. Client claims blindness unconfirmed. The client was from the program. The client was notified of the summons to the court in person. The client did not appear in court. The client was ordered to evict. The client does not respond to messages. We come to the eviction with the police, loaders, and a locksmith. The client crashes after we use the master key to log in. A policeman knocks on her door to ask if she's okay and if she needs an ambulance. The client jumps up and falls on her back, screaming that the police are hitting her. A client asks me, having a law degree, to take her case for a police assault. I told her I was not a police lawyer. Story 34. My first month at the firm where I currently work, a small litigation firm that practices in almost all areas, a man came into my office and said he wanted to die. At first I was surprised, but mostly we talked about it. He was in the army. He watched his friends die for years, was involved in two different plane crashes, one of the few to survive each, has become very religious in the last 20 years. He said he no longer wanted any treatment for any injury no matter what. Basically, if he breaks his arm, he wants to be able to stay at home and let it heal or not. And if not, it will finish him. So be it. He wants to go on his own terms, without medical intervention. The main issues here are mental illness and elder abuse. The assumption is that no sane, ostensibly healthy person would choose to die from a broken arm simply because they don't want treatment. And someone who is intellectually incapacitated cannot execute a directive or other controlling document, thus managing their future health care, property, etc. Elder abuse is a bit more complicated generally say he breaks his arm, refuses to seek medical attention, but his daughter knows he's sitting at home with a broken arm and it's getting worse. The hand gets worse and worse, he suffers pain, and eventually dies. The state can take back the daughter he named as his personal representative and power of attorney in his will and charge her with elder abuse, such as, you knew he was suffering dying, he was obviously incapacitated, couldn't care for yourself, you didn't do anything. 
The state is interested in preserving the lives of its citizens. You violated the interest. So how do we get around these issues? I drew up his directive, which banned all medical services. Most directives specify the acceptance or refusal of rescue medical care. This is standard practice. But there is still a huge gray area in legal precedent when it comes to intentionally denying a person basic expected medical care. To solve this problem, I asked the man to come to our office and asked him a bunch of questions to test his mental fitness. From simple things like self-care feeding to more serious questions like why he wants to do this, how his life led him here, it was his decision. No influence from family, his religious beliefs, etc., all of which was recorded by a professional videographer to make sure he wasn't, to put it simply, completely insane. We talked about how he makes it easier for my daughter, my family, me, our company, etc., from any liability that may arise from his death after this directive, and so on and so forth. To date, nothing has come of it. He is still alive and doing well. Will anything ever come of this? Who knows? But employment and the possible consequences of such a directive are probably the most interesting things I've dealt with. Thinking about it, I feel like an astronaut with a briefcase floating in empty legal space, surrounded by planets made up of wills, trusts, and other sound documents. Anyway, I'm weird. Back to work, I guess. Story 35. Coming out of my hiding habits to post this. Sorry for my broken English. I'm not a native speaker. I call this thing voodoo teleport. It might not be the most outrageous case I've worked on, but it might be the weirdest. That was a few years ago. Fresh out of law school, full of hope. This was my first court case about a guy who came from Togo and asked for asylum in my country because of his, which is still illegal and socially unacceptable in Togo. As his lawyer, where I come from, Belgium, I first have to prepare him for the hearing before the immigration authorities. I cannot be present at his first hearing, so preparation is crucial. So I ask him about how he first entered the country, and this is his story. He told me he came from a village near a sacred, magical, holy whatever waterfall. His grandfather, who seems to be the head of their village, also happens to be a real voodoo healer. The voodoo religion is still very well represented in Togo, and so his grandfather told him that if you say the right spells and prayers in the cave behind the waterfall, it can make your wishes come true. This is what he did. He cast a spell and prayed to get out of the cave for three days and three nights in a row and then passed out. When he woke up, he was in Brussels and very disappointed. He was actually praying to wake up in California. I would be disappointed too. I very diplomatically explained to him that his religion and beliefs are not very popular in Belgium and that the immigration guys would probably have a hard time believing him. He insisted it was true, so here's what he told them. I still have a written record of his hearing. Apparently he made someone laugh. He was finally denied entry to Belgium, but not for the reasons you might think. He was deported back to the Netherlands because he had already applied for asylum there, so Belgium could not let him in. He still calls sometimes to check on me. Story 36. A newly minted attorney, who happens to be an immigration attorney, was at a party talking to someone about my work, and this crazy person who was also at the party overheard and thought I might be able to help him with his problem. Not too likely, but maybe it's a party and there's someone to talk to. I should have realized that this kind of political climate isn't the best for talking about people's knowledge of immigration law, but this dude thought I could help him with, say, annexing part of Mexico somehow, or maybe changing New Mexico. I can, I remember exactly now, make it the 51st state, and then round up all the Mexicans. I think even those who were generations down. Unfortunately, I think I might have been on the list myself. I just don't look Mexican and I wasn't going to tell him and put them in the 51st state. If they lived in the 51st state for like five years or something, worked and avoided crime, would they be eligible for full citizenship and similarly re-enter the other 50 states? Like, there were parts of this plan that were extremely progressive and then obviously parts that were extremely authoritarian. It was just weird. And it was the hardest conversation I've ever had to have. He turned his back for a split second and I said, Hey, you, to someone I actually knew and then awkwardly avoided this guy for the rest of the party. Story 37. Recently, the guy decides to break the lease and move to another house. The landlord sued for two months' rent. Instead of paying two months' rent, $3,000, he pays me $2,000 to take the case to court, despite my insistence and outright promise that he basically can't win it. $2,000 was fair because there was nothing to do in this case, because there was no defense. The landlord was too stupid to move for summary judgment. 
Anyway, go to court. Give the guy his day in court. He absolutely cannot be the rock star on the stand that he thought he was. He loses, the judge awards attorney fees, and he walks out of court owing the landlord $3,000 plus $22,000 in attorney fees. I dismissed a family law case today because I had a calendar conflict with an upcoming hearing. A potential client waited a week before the hearing to try to hire an attorney, Sigh. He says that he and the child's mother recently moved in together. She insists his name isn't on the birth certificate so he doesn't have parental rights. But she's still seeking child support and alimony for the time the three of them lived together. What? Another case where a boy wanted to sue the city for costing him a million dollars in lost employment opportunities because they allegedly failed to properly expunge his criminal record was dismissed. After asking him a few more questions to see if I could really help him in any meaningful way, he got frustrated, called me a fool, and cursed at me. I uploaded it, and a week later the BBB said it had a bad review. The review claimed that I cussed at him, called him a fool, and to hell with him. I told the BB that one of those three things was true. The operator smiled and told me they would make a note, and the review would not be public. Story 38. I am a lawyer, and I practice mainly in the fields of labor law and workers' rights. Many people have contacted me with strange situations, but one in particular stands out. This guy approached me about the violation of his civil rights. He didn't give me much information over the phone, so I made an appointment with him. Sometimes people confuse their civil rights with employment rights, so I doubted him. I figured if I couldn't help him, maybe I could refer him to someone who could. So he comes and tells me he wants to sue the government. I tell him I need to know what he thinks the government has been doing to him, and he tells me they have been monitoring his thoughts and stealing his ideas. Then a crazy bell went off in my head. Now this guy looked and acted like a perfectly normal person. He was simply convinced that the government was somehow stealing the thoughts in his head. He didn't know how exactly it happened. I think it has something to do with satellites or TV signals. I briefly considered recommending that he fashion a hat out of tin foil to block the signals, but that seemed a bit unprofessional. The guy didn't seem dangerous or anything, so I wondered how I would respond based on my knowledge of the law if what he was saying was true. First, if some government agency were to steal his thoughts using mind control satellites, that would likely violate his Fourth Amendment right to be free from unlawful search and seizure. The problem is, you can't just sue the government for this. Under federal law, you must sue the actual person or persons who deprive you of your rights under the law. Second, we had no hard evidence that the person who stole his thoughts was actually a statesman. For all we knew, it could have been an individual or a corporation. And finally, even if we can prove that someone is stealing his ideas, how can we prove damages? Sure, there's an invasion of privacy, but it's hard to measure the damage in dollars. So I expressed my opinion to him that we don't have enough evidence as to who is responsible and exactly how much damage was done to him. I suggested that he get another attorney's opinion if he wanted, and if he could find convincing evidence for his claim, I would be willing to talk to him again. He seemed quite satisfied with this answer, so we shook hands and he left. I'm no psychologist, but it seemed obvious to me that this guy was operating under a pretty big delusion. I considered recommending that he see a psychiatrist, but thought that would be out of my area. But since then, I sometimes look back and wonder, what if he was right?